This week in the Enterprise Security News, how the DoD is using open source software. BitSight launches a new product. Sentinel One teams up with Sumo Logic. Fortinet is addressing the IoT security problem with a product announcement. SecureWorks is opening up its proprietary UEBA platform. Swimlane is supporting McAfee's Security Operations Center. In our final uh, second two segments, we'll be airing some interviews that we did at Black Hat and DEF CON, specifically with Mimecast, Synopsis, ThreatX, and Versec. All that and more on this episode of Enterprise Security Weekly. This is Security Weekly, for security professionals, by security professionals. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where we talk security vendors and aren't afraid to name names. It's Enterprise Security Weekly. I'm a tiger. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Welcome to Enterprise Security Weekly. I don't know how this is going to go because Paul's not here this week, but we're just going to give it a shot. If Even if you've got experience in security, you're, you can benefit from going to somewhere where, and learning about that bug again. Wearing my tactical turtleneck just for Mr. John Strand, who is on the lines via Skype. John, welcome to the program. I'm wearing the uh, tactical fleece as well, Paul. This is Excellent. a fully, completely, and utterly tactical show. Improve the efficiency and effectiveness of your security operations with DF Lab Security Orchestration, Automation, and Response Technology. Automate threat containment, orchestrate incident response, and measure operational performance with DF Lab's InCommand SOAR platform. Leverage your current security resources to minimize incident resolution time, maximize analyst efficiency, increase the number of incidents handled, and reduce overall risk. InCommand SOAR acts as a force multiplier, enabling your security team to do more with less. Streamline the full incident response life cycle automation process today. Keep your cybersecurity incidents under control with DF Labs. Visit dflabs.com forward slash security weekly and request to see Ink Mansoor live in action. Stop attackers from domain credential theft and lateral movement with a 99% success rate by using artificial intelligence to control the attacker's perception of the environment. Javelin Networks is the world's first endpoint intrusion containment platform to protect domain networks. Javelin detects targeted attacks and breaches by obfuscating Active Directory, domain controllers, domain identities, domain credentials, and all domain resources. It only takes one compromised machine to jeopardize the entire organization. Don't be a victim. Visit javelin-networks.com and request a demo of AD Protect today. Are you worried about PCI compliance? Does your development team understand or care about security? Are you ready to face a breach of your customer's sensitive data? See the worst that can happen before it does. Black Hills Information Security can help you help management see the future. Email consulting at blackhillsinfosec.com to find out how a web application penetration test can mitigate the risk before you go live. Welcome everyone to episode 105 of Enterprise Security Weekly for September 5th, 2018. I'm of course your host, Paul Asadorian, broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island and on the lines, uh, either via Skype or Zoom, is Mr. John Strand. John, welcome. Still coming in from Skype for right now, although I go. could change over to Zoom at some point in the near future. You guys just let me know. But today I'm screwing around, playing around with uh, creating mining pools, mining Ethereum, Monero, because I'm kind of getting into this whole uh, cryptocurrency thing. It seems like a lot of fun. It's awesome. Yeah, I um, I do receive regular emails uh, from a lot of PR companies and security vendors, multiple ones a day, uh, advertising their services and research and all that stuff. And I, I get a fair amount. Uh, for blockchain. And there's a lot of companies trying to get in on the security side of things. And mm -hmm. I still think today it's really applicable to currency. I, I, other than the supply chain use case, I really, I, I struggle to find uh, a place. I think there will be. I just think it's too early uh, mm -hmm. for us to, to kind of focus on it. Yeah. But I'm looking and, for and that. If it works that for in, supply right? chain, isn't that awesome right there? I mean, yeah, that's, absolutely. that's pretty cool. Uh, just to start with. But no, I actually got a couple of emails. I don't know if you did as well last week, but uh, me saying, hey, you know, blockchain is something that we should be looking into. We need to be yeah. aware of it. And if you just say it's stupid and you just walk away from it, you're missing out. Mm -hmm. Boy, did I piss off some people. <laughs> um, so that that was a lot of fun. So there people are angry. so people have the belief that uh, it is stupid, basically, is what they're arguing. 
they believed it was stupid. And one person in particular uh, called me out and basically said, well, we got to, we got to maintain a healthy skepticism. And I never want, I don't think you or I said, Hey, there's mm. no skepticism here. Right, right. Let's drink the Kool-Aid. But as far as a fundamental core technology of what's going to be changing in the future, I do believe that it's going to be part of that. Mm -hmm. So I'm continuing to play with it because part of being a healthy skeptic is having a healthy understanding because ultimately yes. that's what hackers do. Yeah. So let's get into that's it. Let's point. start digging around. Just don't ignore it. Let's dig into some stories, John, particularly yes. open source software uh, and its usage at the DoD. And I think uh, many of us know that uh, that have worked in the DoD in any capacity know that they use open source, right? I mean, it's, it's not a secret, uh, I don't think. I mean, maybe how and exactly where they're using open source, I'm sure some of that is shrouded in secrecy. Uh, However, they were presenting at the Open Source Secure Open Source Conference. What was that called? Uh, there was another story that came out of this this conference. The Open Source Summit. Open Source Summit, and mm -hmm. someone is quoted as saying something that's very concerning to me, and that is, and I quote: "You don't have to reinvent the wheel. You can just find something someone else has done and get up to speed mm -hmm. very quickly." Referencing open source. I don't disagree with the fundamental premise and value that open source provides in this context. However, uh, I put my security hat on and I'm like, hold on, red flag. And the, the big red flag for me is not that someone might have a vulnerability in their code, and sure that's gonna happen and they're gonna fix it and the Linux uh, Foundation, uh, Open Source Foundation has pledged uh, to improve the security uh, of Linux. They're a little light on the details in what I was reading, but they are certainly aware of it and working on it. However, the more concerning thing for me is any open source software that implements some kind of package system. Uh, we talk about this, John, on Application Security Weekly uh, with the Node Package Manager or uh, NPM, right? And mm -hmm. how you're including other people's modules. And how do you know which ones to trust and which ones not to trust? And if you do validate and trust a module, what happens if the maintainer of that module, one of uh, two things happens or both, right? They have vulnerabilities in their code and they go away and they abandon the project and they never update it. So there could be an infinite number of vulnerabilities that will never be addressed because and you don't know that they've abandoned it. Uh, and the other thing is what if the developer of that module or add-on or plugin uh, gets owned and someone else takes control over uh, that particular plugin? Now you're incorporating this open source as is stated here in this article and you've got vulnerabilities that you don't know about. You've got a lot of unknowns in, in those scenarios. That's my primary concern is mostly with the package and library management. But my, my counter to that is, how is this new? Mm. I mean, whenever you're talking about packages and a lot of inter interlocking code, it's been that way for you know 30 years uh, in some situations. And really, you know, we talk about Linux and the advent of Linux and Red Hat Package Manager and all that stuff, it, it it's really hasn't changed. Um, so one of the concerns I have is actually creating a straw man and saying, well, this is something that concerns me. And there hasn't been any, like, oh, I guess there has been, TCP dump. There's been a couple of situations where open source uh, projects have actually had uh, had vulnerabilities in them, like TCP dump with W well, clone and W all being and, set at the same time. And don't forget, but those Heart, were caught Heartbleed, really Heart, And Heartbleed was the big one, which forced is stated in an article I read yesterday as forcing a change in yeah. the mindset about open source uh, security in the software. But does anything about that fundamentally change the way that we have to look at open source? Does yeah, Heartbleed yeah. make us say that open source is inherently more or less secure than it was before? All code is going to have vulnerabilities. The bigger concern that I have, and it, it kind of, it, it, it's a different take on, on your concern, is whenever you're looking at the big projects, right? Like you're looking at Linux, you're looking at Apache, you're looking at these very large projects that are used by a tremendous number of organizations and they're contributing, those tend to be the more secure products because there's a lot of people looking over them. But as soon as you start getting off that happy, shiny path into the weeds, and I think that's kind of where your concern comes in, where you're starting to incorporate third-party modules that are, you know, haven't been updated since, you know, 2009, all of a sudden, we now have a concern, and I think that's my number one concern when we're talking about open source in any type of instantiation is making sure that um, you know you're, you're you're kind of watching out for those fringe open source products yeah. that are out. There. Well, and also, you know, it, it speaks to technical debt as well. Uh, if we look at mm -hmm. Equifax and the Java Struts vulnerability, when we were digging into that, I think last week or the week before. Um, the further you get behind on versions, it, it is essentially a library. Some will call it a framework. Some will call it a library. 
But if you're using an open source library or plugin or add-on, right, and you're not updating it, the more technical debt you incur, the harder it is to fix that, which is why mm-hmm. I truly believe the Equifax breach uh, was a result of that vulnerability. The reason why it wasn't patched is they incurred so much technical debt that the effort to bring it up to the latest version and patch it was just too much. enormous. And they, they, yep. you can't do it quickly. So I think we need to be mindful of technical debt mm-hmm. in this scenario too. And let's talk about technical debt and FireEye. I mean, at, at core, the, the vulnerabilities that Tavis came up with, it was like a year or two years ago, uh, were vulnerabilities in some of the open source products that were being used, uh, specifically, I think, in QMU yeah. and the way it handed emulation. And it wasn't a problem in QMU per se. It was a problem that this commercial product was using a version of the open source technologies that hadn't been updated in a long time. So you still may be using a commercial product, yes. but there's still open source being used in it, and you still have that technical debt. So I don't see this as an intrinsically open source problem per mm-hmm. se. It's basically just a code problem, no matter what you look at. Yeah, and it's interesting. The next segue into the uh, segue into the next story is uh, analyzing your risk or more importantly, analyzing the risk of your third-party vendors or companies you're going to acquire. Of course, there's a whole category in security that uh, is centered around that, and BitSight is one of those uh, and has enhanced its capability um, to measure and rate organizations. They also use the term benchmark their cybersecurity posture. And I, just before the show, I, you know, I was taking John back to the days when I worked at a university, and I was exposed to auditors for like the first time in an actual setting. And I was like, well, that's great. Like you can ask questions and, and, and fill out a, a, a worksheet of like what we say we're doing and what we say we're not doing. But where does the, the rubber meet the road or the hands meet the keyboard where we're actually seeing what we're doing or not doing? Like there's what we believe we have for controls. And then there's controls that are actually in place. And John, you and your team probably experienced this on, well, I mean, let's be frank, every single penetration test, right? Yeah. Well, in this is, you know, we're talking about this just before the show and I hate it whenever we get all worked up before the show actually starts because then we got to redo everything and be (laughs) excited like, hey, we haven't talked about this already. (laughs) But uh, the concern that I have with all of these different cyber risk companies, and I'm not saying that this is a bad idea. It's just how many different points of analysis are they using to do an overall risk rating for a company? And that limited subset of points that they're analyzing, is that actually a good future predictor? of the overall risk associated with that organization. And I think anybody that's looking to purchase something like BitSight, and BitSight should be welcoming these types of questions. Sure. Is there any examples that they can say, we had this company at a low risk, or excuse me, a high risk rating, and then they got compromised? How many of those stories and those narratives do they have? Like you talked about Equifax. Is it one of those situations where like, yeah, we were giving Equifax a really low score for like their 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 overall um their overall risk was just off the charts and they got hacked. Are there any of those kind of KPIs, mm. key performance indicators that they're looking at that actually helped them identify a, a company that actually was compromised? Because that would be a great story. But I don't know if a limited subset of externally facing um, points that you can do analysis on are actually indicative of the overall health of an organization. Yeah, I mean, they do dig into the internals, but again, it's it's more like a questionnaire. And I, I believe some of these uh, companies also include uh, hands-on testing or reviewing their own vulnerability management uh, and vulnerability scanning results uh, can be part of it. So I, I think your mileage is, is going to vary, but certainly some mm-hmm. good uh, points to take into consideration if you're evaluating these technologies especially at a larger company, right? You may have hundreds of vendors. You may be looking at acquiring several companies. Uh, and how are you doing that validation is certainly, you know, on the CSO's, uh, the CISO's desk for sure. So, yeah. And then I've talked to a number of our customers that have actually purchased BitSight. Mm-hmm. And it, it's kind of unfortunate. Like I said, the promise of what they're offering just sounds amazing. But right now, it's it's kind of it's kind of at the point where a lot of the people are very meh on the service. Um, so that could be a small sample set on my side. But no, ask questions, ask for different case studies on uh, on any type of actionable intelligence that they've given their 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 customers about organizations that have a high risk because those are good things to ask. And there might be some really, really great stories along that that will really drive it home. Uh, Sentinel-1 has teamed up with Sumo Logic. Um, by means of this collaboration, Sumo Logic customers will gain the ability to make use of Sentinel One's next generation endpoint protection directly via the Sumo Logic platform. 
to avert, identify, and undo known as well as unknown threats in real time. That's a bold claim. It is. It is. Well, I think that this is a good pairing, though. Um, but how much of this, Paul, do you think is companies like Sentinel One and Sumo Logic scrambling to try to create that complete offering to compete with McAfee and Symantec and Sophos and Microsoft that are now starting to come up uh, with the ability to compete with them um, from like the user behavioral entity analytics, from a next generation endpoint security? Mm -hmm. it, it almost seems like these people are starting to partner up and get purchased to compete with the big boys that are now starting to roll into the space more and more every year. Yeah, I will say that uh, one company who is a sponsor that I'm impressed with on, on this front is Logarithm. I think they balance all of these technologies such as the endpoint, the network visibility, the SIM and the logging side. They balance those very well. I think many other players in the space you know, have their strengths and weaknesses and rely on integrations, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. Um, I even think when you look at someone like a McAfee, I think they're weak on the the logging and analytics side, right? Oh yeah, it, absolutely. I mean, <laughs> very true. You can, I mean, how strong are they on the endpoint side as well? I think you got to add on other products to strengthen up your posture on the endpoint side, like we talked about the Minerva Labs uh, mm -hmm. integration. And so, you know, hearing that actually, um, which ties into our, our our next story, you know, McAfee's been making some really good partnerships on the security side to augment. Uh, their capabilities, which uh, they actually just chose Swimlane, which is a big mm -hmm. win for Swimlane. Uh, is uh, the well, of course, they're the leader in security orchestration. They play in the category of security uh, orchestration for sure. Um, they announced that their SOAR platform from Swimlane will be used by McAfee's uh, Security Operations Center or SOC. Um, which I mean, that's great validation for Swimlane that a big SOC operations center like McAfee has chosen them to do their automation and orchestration. That's, that's a good thing for Swimlane. Yep, and this also gets back into the question that we talked about in a previous show that we need to just have a full show dedicated to. Rip and replace or continue yeah. working with the technology that you have. Mm -hmm. And what you're seeing McAfee doing with the incorporation of these other different products, right, whether it's a whether it's alliance or a partnership or whatever, is they're making that McAfee platform extensible. So if you want to be working with Swimlane, you, you absolutely can. They're like, hey, come on and play with us. We're perfectly cool. Uh, with that. But this gets into a really, really hard question. If you're a CIO, CFO, COO, and you are looking at a whole new endpoint security solution, SIM solution, all of it tied together, are you really going to rip out everything that you have and replace it with another right. vendor? Or is it more attractive to stick with something like McAfee and start sticking these other different technologies on it, uh, like Legos? But this is, I'm not answering this question. I'm just saying this yeah. is something that people have to answer um, if they're going to be moving their security architectures forward. Well, and I, th I think you alluded to a great point too, which is uh, McAfee is making these alliances and partnerships to, uh, as a stickiness for their customers, for customer retention. Yes, right? absolutely. It, because, absolutely. Okay, I'm not going to rip and replace McAfee uh, because, well, now I can add on Minerva get some great endpoint protection there. And now I can, I can add on swim lane. swim lane or, or if I'm using McAfee's sock, uh, you know, they're using swim lane and they're more, more efficient. So I think all of these are so that you stick with the McAfee uh, platform, which I think is what yep. makes good integrate. Well, it certainly drives the decision for integrations, whether they're good or not remains to be seen. Mm -hmm. Although I do think the Minerva uh, and McAfee uh, marriage there is, is pretty awesome though. Well, and the more McAfee does this, the more it actually embeds themselves even deeper into organizations because they're they're basically removing any kind of barriers to keeping their product in place. Um, for a long time, with traditional blacklist AV like McAfee or Symantec or something like that, it was very, very, very easy to say, you know what, this thing is a flaming piece of crap. Yeah, it, it's a one-trick pony. Getting, it's yeah. horrible. Yeah. But now it's getting harder and harder to make that determination. Uh, Fortinet uh, has released uh, an update to what it calls its Fortinac, which allows IT and OT teams to document all the connected devices on their IoT network, giving them the ability to uh, shut them down and segment and isolate sections of the network. I think that's interesting. I think a this lot of uh, companies are, are messaging on this. Um, what's the other... Is it another Fort company, Fortinet? Fort I, I can't remember. Fort There's, uh, Fort, this Fort was, we had a story on this last week, right? Yeah. I, um, I don't know. I, I think, think it was Qualys, wasn't it? Who the hell Qualys, was it? Qualys does have an identification platform uh, that's passive, uh, yes. <laughs> but they don't ever cross that line and say that they do vulnerability management. Right, because of the patent. But no, this is an interesting one because, I mean, you can make exceptions for IoT 
uh, devices. And what about the ones that should be there? Like, I guess you can put them in a different segment if it should be there. But the larger question is, what if something that should be there somehow changes? It's being abused by an attacker or its state has changed in some way. How do you identify that condition? Like, it's one thing to identify and and contain and put it and put it in a place. But how, how do you know if like whatever IoT device I have that might be critical for my business, what if someone has owned that device or... Uh, credentials have leaked out or whatever, and now a new device is trying to impersonate it, right? There's a lot of attack scenarios Look, that you got to catch. But you're coming back to the key point. It's always segment because a lot of those devices you just can't patch. You can't update. You can't change the default password. So you're going to be in a, you're going to be a game of, of segmentation and isolation. Right. Yeah. And I, I think so. that does put a good amount of security controls around it. I think the real question is how accurate is the identification today of IoT devices? Um, there's, there's a, a number of startups actually working on that. We did a, a briefing with Armus. Armus has a really awesome database uh, of that and uh, some really smart technology around it. So, um, and yeah. they partner, you know, with uh, the network admission control uh, vendors, uh, you know, to do that stuff. I would imagine. And are they um, doing it passively on like user agent strings or you know actively scanning to identify? What was their What was their approach? Uh, I'd have to go back through my notes. God, I don't want to get it wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Because really, for those that are listening, there's two ways to do this, and really only two ways to do this. Number one, you can identify the devices by passively sitting on the wire, and that's kind of what Fortinet is doing. That's what Qualys is doing. That's what uh, Tenable, they're no longer calling it passive vulnerability scanner. I can't remember what they're calling it now. But uh, basically passively watching for user agent strings as they leave or fingerprinting, and then an active scan with something like Nmap, and then doing a fingerprint of it. Uh, so there's two different approaches, and then tying that together into something that's meaningful, that's where the big money's at. Mm. Yeah, and I think Armus's approach is the passive approach, looking at, you know, when okay. an IoT device reaches out and goes to update or something, um, you know, access a certain DNS servers or whatever, they can identify the device. I would imagine that'd be um, a more accurate way than trying to, I mean, I worked at Tenable for seven years, right? Interrogating an IoT device and trying to figure out what it is, like only gets you so far, right? Like, yeah. and you have that, um, high uh, occurrence of that device crashing when you do yeah. that. Yeah, you know, with a lot. I, I mean, it's getting better, but by and large, a lot of IoT or SCADA or PLCs or whatever devices that are out there, the rule of thumb for most pen testers is, uh, you know, ping it, make sure you can connect to the network, and then just leave it the hell alone. And I've talked to some pen yeah. testers like, oh, you can totally go through and exploit those things. Those people are not wise. Do not listen to them. Yes. And they haven't been doing this very long. So, yeah, it's a, I, it's a dangerous game. I remember question. I was on a, a pen test back in the day, and I used Nmap to scan their wireless controller. Oh, and I remember this one. Yeah. They're like, not, <laughs> uh, and we're like, we totally, I was like, something bad could happen, but uh, like, we're going to do this scan. Like, I'm, I'm just going to do an Nmap port scan. Let's, let's just see like what's exposed on the network to it. And the thing crashed. Like, Instantly, entire wireless yeah. network down uh, for the entire organization. Just Always from your fault, an though. Nmap scan. Yeah, uh, they were good about. It. I mean, they were like glad you found it. Then, then someone else, right, reported it to the vendor. Vendor fixed it, um, and they were you know more resilient as a result. But that's the kind of situation we run into with active scanning of IoT devices. Yeah. Uh, the last story we have here is SecureWorks opens up their proprietary UEBA uh, through partner programs. So it, it sounds like to me that SecureWorks has an offering as part of their MSP or MSSP services that basically you can have this UEBA component with their endpoint as like one solution. And now they're kind of stripping away that analytics portion and offering that up separately. My question is, you know, are you a product company or a services company? Both is really hard. SecureWorks has done really well doing both. However... Uh, it, it, they're difficult waters to navigate, John, as you and I very this, well know, right? I mean, but but this is a good move for them. I mean, you talk about are you a product or you service? There's no way in hell you're a company of the size of SecureWorks and you say you're either pure play one or the other. Yeah. I mean, um, they have unique security problems and challenges that very few organizations can address or have ever encountered, right? Mm -hmm. So whenever you're trying to manage the security of one organization, that's hard. But whenever you're trying to manage the security of or like hundreds of organizations, it gets exponentially more difficult. So I think that that user behavioral analytics and uh, basically opening it up to customers' uh, environments, it's not just a good product. It also helps their analysts basically cut through the noise a lot faster to get to better signal-to-noise ratio. Absolutely. 
Cool. Well, some really good stories uh, this week. Uh, I really liked uh, the news uh, this week. It was fun to cover. Um, I feel bad though. We didn't rip on any vendors. We were we were pretty nice this well. The, the announcements were pretty were pretty sound. Uh, so yeah, yeah sure. we didn't do much. I wonder if we can we can make McAfee mad. We can talk about McAfee and John McAfee. Yeah. They don't like those two things being associated. He lost that. his mind this weekend. Well, yeah, the news there was he basically said there's uh, an unhackable cryptocurrency he was working on that turns out was totally hackable. Which, well, and then he, he said he invented computer security. Oh, did he say that too? Yeah. Well. So. So there, I guess we just made McAfee mad. Uh, he was one John of the. I mean, the to John's credit, he was one of the early people working on security problems. Uh, you know, I, and I, I mean, inventing security is a stretch. That's not. Yeah, I'm not saying that. It, it's it not is, a, but we've interviewed stretch, John. But, yeah. John's no, was nice to us, right? We like yeah, exactly. talking with John because he's, he's a, insane. But you cannot question the guy is bright. Um, is a, he's, a, he is absolutely days. brilliant um, and a very personable. Uh, individual it's it, it's enjoyable to talk to john um because he is so brilliant and he's got like that wackiness component but he grounds it in like being really smart too so he's just a fascinating person uh to, to talk to so but yeah i'm yeah, making a claim that something is not hackable doesn't usually end he should i can't better. think of a scenario where it's ended well <laughs> for anyone uh so well <laughs> i mean your product is more secure after after all said and done you, you do discover, uh, or other people discover a lot of security flaws. So there is that. So with that, uh, we'll take a short break. I'll come back. I'm going to uh, introduce uh, four very short interviews. They're not long form interviews. They're very short interviews. Uh, I'll set the stage for, for four of those, and then we'll jump right into those interviews.